Hello fanatics, welcome to Diamond Painting Fanatics. I am Cindy, it is Thursday, therefore it is true crime story time. I like doing my true crime, I like delving into cases, I, I am not up there with the true crime well known YouTubers, um, I do this purely as a hobby and an extension on my channel. Last week I did Stephen Avery and I'm getting a lot of comments on that video and it's welcomed. I love discussing the cases in the comment thread on my true crimes. I was half and half and I was half and half because like I said when he was 18 he did a burglary then he went on to animal cruelty which is an escalation we typically see in serial killers or killers in general however I am swayed more to him being completely innocent of the second crime his first crime because he was already found innocent of the first crime that they stitched him up on so I was chatting in the comments and I said to Dark Side of the Moon, I believe, would they have stitched him up for 400 grand or $400,000 in America? And he was like, no, it goes far beyond that. And if they were to find him innocent of a second crime, they would have to investigate all the crimes committed under this... Um, district attorney or whoever was in charge of the actual case that's pretty scary that is pretty scary to think that they're leaving him there because they don't want to get investigated because how many people have they innocently put in prison how many crimes have they made fit into their narrative that's one scary thought isn't it so sticking with corrupt police officers i thought i would go there again this week this centers around one individual who when he was a teenager he wanted to become a police officer my question is why because if you typically want to do something in your life that you work hard to achieve. You put all your effort, all your energy into making that happen. And if you are becoming a police officer, one would think you have integrity and you want to rid the world of guilty people, murderers, burglaries, any number of crimes. You want to put the guilty people away. I do not understand Christopher Dorner's choice in becoming a police officer for reasons we will discuss as we talk about him in just a second. This goes far beyond just one individual. Um, my true crime story time this week is shocking on many levels. All because of Christopher Dorner. So grab a project. If you are crafting along with me, if you are just watching, welcome. Um, I do true crime every Thursday because I do lots of other content on my channel related to diamond painting, but I love true crime as well. So I add that into my playlists. If you are crafting, grab your project, grab a drink, come join me as we discuss Christopher Dorner. Christopher Dorner was born on the 4th of July in 1979, the same year as me. He was born in New York and grew up in Southern California. He attended Cypress High School 
in Cyprus, California, where he graduated in 1997. Dorna then graduated from Southern Utah University in 2001 with a major in political science and a minor in psychology. I don't understand this. Politi I mean, he's, he has a brain, doesn't he? He's very clever. While there, he was a football running back from 1999 to 2000. Dorna later stated that he was the only African-American student in his school from first grade to seventh grade. And he also stated that he had altercations there due to racism. When he was a teenager, he decided to become a police officer and he joined a youth programme offered by the police department in La Palma. Neighbours described Dorna as belonging to an admired, well-liked family and a man who usually kept to himself. He was previously married with no children and court records show that his wife filed for divorce in 2007. Dorna was a United States Navy Reserve Officer commissioned in 2002. He commanded a security unit at the Naval Air Force Fallon, I believe in Nevada. He served with a mobile inshore undersea welfare unit from June 2004 to February 2006 and was deployed to Bahrain with the Coastal Riverine Group 2 from November 2006 until April 2007. He was honourably discharged from the Naval Reserve as a lieutenant on February the 1st, 2013. A point I will come back to. In 2002, while a student at undergraduate pilot training at Vance Air Force Base in Oklahoma, Dorna and a classmate found a bag containing nearly $8,000, the equivalent to about $12,100 in today. This bag belonged to the nearby Enid Korean Church of Grace and the two, Dorna and his friend, handed the money into the police. When asked their motive, Dorna replied, quote, the military stresses integrity. There was a couple of thousand dollars and if people are willing to give that to a church, it must be pretty important to them." End quote. Dorna also stated that his mother taught him honesty and integrity. I would like to ask where his integrity vanishes to in a little while. During his time, as a reservist, Dorna received a Navy Rifle Markmanship Ribbon and a Navy Pistol Shot Ribbon with an expert device. During his time as a Naval Reservist, Dorna joined the Los Angeles Police Department, the LAPD, 
He entered the police academy in 2005 and graduated in 2006. Shortly afterwards, his duties as a probationary officer were interrupted when he was deployed by the Navy Reserve to Bahrain. On his return from duty in July 2007, Dorna was paired with officer, training officer Teresa Evans to complete his probationary training. According to the Los Angeles Times, Evans said that on Dorna's first working day with her, he told her that he planned to sue the LAPD after he completed his probationary period in response to how the LAPD had responded to complaints that he had previously made against his classmates. Now, he's on probation. You have to pass probation to become a police officer. And he's already causing waves. On July 28th, 2007, Dorna and Evans responded to the Doubletree Hotel in San Pedro, Pedro, California, regarding a disturbance caused by Christopher Gettler. Gettler suffered from schizophrenia with severe dementia. Dorna filed a report alleging that Evans had used excessive force in her treatment of Gettler. He accused her of twice kicking Gettler in the chest and once in the face while he was handcuffed and laying on the ground. Gettler's father testified that his son told him he had been kicked by a police officer. Dorna filed the report the day after being told that Evans had given an evaluation saying that he needed to improve his performance. Go figure, doesn't this scream narcissistic? The LAPD investigated the complaint examining the allegation against Evans and the truthfulness of Dorna's report through an internal review board of three members, two LAPD captains and a criminal defence attorney. During the seven month investigation of Dorna's complaint, Teresa Evans was assigned to desk duty and was not allowed to earn money outside of her LAPD job. Now, I'm assuming that if you are on desk duty, you earn a lot less than if you are out on patrol and stuff. Hence, they're stressing that. Dorna's attorney at the board hearing was a former LAPD captain. Randall. The review board heard testimony from a number of witnesses. Two hotel employees testified that they did not see Evans kick Gettler. Additionally, a port police officer testified that he did not see Evans kick Gettler. However, some aspects of his statement contradict photographs from the scene. Gettler was brought into the police station and given medical treatment for injuries to his face but did not mention being kicked at that time. According to Gettler's father later that day, Gettler told his father that he had been kicked 
by an officer and his father testified to that at Dorna's disciplinary hearing. In a videotaped interview with Dorna's attorney, Randall, shown at the hearing, Gettler stated that he was kicked in the face by a female police officer on the day and in the place in question. However, when Gettler testified at the hearing, his responses to the questioning were described as, quote, generally incoherent and non-responsive, end quote. The investigation concluded that there was no kicking and later decided that Dorna had lied. This is not going to go well, is it? Because in my opinion, he's a narcissist personality. In 2008, Dorna was fired by the LAPD for making false statements in his report and in his testimony against Evans. Dorna's attorney, Randall, stated that Dorna was treated unfairly and was being made a scapegoat. It's important to note here, Randall is on his side. He's being treated unfairly and he's a scapegoat. Dorna appealed his termination by filing a mandamus with the LA County Superior Court. Judge David Yaff wrote that he was, quote, uncertain whether the training officer kicked the suspect or not, end quote, but none other, nevertheless upheld the department's decision to fire Dorna, according to the Los Angeles Times. The judge ruled that he would presume that the LAPD's accusations that Dorna's report was false would stand even though he did not know if his report of Evans kicking Gettler was false. This enraged Dorna, who yelled out in disbelief at the end of the hearing, quote, I told the truth, how can this happen? The ruling, end quote. Dorna then appealed to the California Court of Appeal, which affirmed the lower court's ruling on October the 3rd, 2011. Under California law, administrative findings, in this case the LAPD, are entitled to a presumption of correctness and the petitioner, Dorna, bears the burden of proving that they were incorrect. The appeals court concluded that the LAPD had substantial evidence for its finding that Dorna was not credible in his allegations against Evans. Poor Evans, she just got lumbered with him, said, fuck your ideas up, you need to improve, and stuck on desk duty while all this is going on. In early February 2013, Dorna posted a detailed note on his Facebook page. He discussed his history, his motivations and his plans. This 11,000 word post became known as his manifesto. Dorna listed 40 law enforcement personnel whom he was prepared 
to kill. And he stated, quote, I know most of you who personally know me are in disbelief to hear from media reports that I am suspected of committing such horrendous murders. We're about to talk about those. And have taken drastic action and shocking actions in the last couple of days. End quote. That's how the post began. Later on, quote, Unfortunately, this is a necessary evil that I do not enjoy, but I must partake and complete for substantial change to occur within the LAPD and reclaim my name. The department has not changed since the Rampart and Rodney King days. It has gotten worse. End quote. Dorna issued a single demand, a public admission by the LAPD that his termination was in retaliation for reporting excessive force. He also asked journalists to, quote, pursue the truth, end quote, pointing out specific lines of the investigation for reporters to follow under the Freedom of Information Act. On February the 9th, 2013, in response to Dorna's manifesto and the start of the killing spree, LAPD Chief Charlie Beck informed Dorna through the media that there would be a review of the disciplinary case that led to Dorna's dismissal. Beck said officials would re-examine the allegations made by Dorna that his law enforcement career was undone by racist colleagues. Again, we play in the race card and this upsets me. I'm not racist, I'm not sexist, I'm not homophobic. I hate it when they pull out the race card and it's the first time he's done this in his manifesto. Dorna's threat in his manifesto caused law enforcement to mount a widespread manhunt that spread from California to Nevada and Mexico. Protection details were set up for over 40 potential targets of Dorna and thousands of police were assigned to patrol Southern California's highways. The LAPD also took patrol officers off motorcycles for their own protection. On February the 1st, 2013, Anderson Cooper received a package at his office containing a DVD that stated Dorna's case against the LAPD. The package also contained a bullet riddled challenge coin issued by the LAPD Chief William Bratton with a note inscribed with, quote, 1-M-O-A, one minute of angle, implying that the coin was shot at from a 100 yards at a grouping of one inch. I have no idea what that means, but basically he's boasting of his accuracy with a rifle. February 3rd. During the evening hours in Irvine, California, 28-year-old Monica and her fiancé, 27-year-old Kevin, were shot dead in Keith's parked white Kia Optima outside 
their condominium complex. Monica, a women's basketball assistance coach at Cal State Fullerton, was the daughter of Randall, the former LAPD captain and the lawyer who was representing Donna during his 2008 dismissal hearing. Keith was a campus public safety officer for the University of Southern California. Now, I'm outraged because Randall was on his side and he's killed his daughter and her fiance. February 4th, Dorna's manifesto was posted online stating his motive for the shootings and that was to clear his name. He wrote, quote, I will not be alive to see my name cleared. That's what this is about, my name, end quote. How can you clear your name when you have now become a murderer? Of two people. February 5th. According to military sources, Dorna checked into naval base point Loma in San Diego, but skipped checkout procedures when leaving. February 6th. Dorna's manifesto specifically named Randall and his family as targets. So on February 6th, Irvine police named Dorna as the prime suspect in the murders of Monica and Keith. The manifesto claimed that Randall had failed to represent Dorna's interest in favour of those with the LAPD. Dorna reported specific acts of specific officers partic participating in the retaliation, but their names were redacted by the media sources at the request of law enforcement who cited officer safety concerns. Rightly so. February 7th, two LAPD officers were driving to a protection detail where they were assigned as security for one of the officers potentially targeted by Dorna when they were flagged down by R. L. McDaniel at around 1 a.m. McDaniel reported seeing a man matching Dorna's description at a gas station in Corona. The officers investigated the report and they were following a pickup truck when the driver stopped, got out and fired a rifle at them, grazing the head of one officer. About 20 minutes after the corona shooting, two officers of the neighbouring Riverside Police Department were ambushed and shot while stopped in their marked patrol unit at a red light in that city. One officer, Michael Cran, died shortly after the shooting the other was rushed to a nearby hospital in critical condition for surgery and survived. So the victim count is now three. About an hour and 25 minutes after the Riverside shooting at approximately 3 a.m., a man matching Dorna's description tried to steal a boat in San Diego, telling the boat's captain that he would take a boat to Mexico. A federal criminal complaint 
was filed against Dorna this same day for allegedly fleeing California to avoid prosecution. And again, I think the point of this was to rack up the criminal charges um, to build a stronger case, basically. Hours later, the burning remains of Dorna's vehicle, a dark grey 2005 Nissan Titan truck, were found on a remote fire trail by a local, Daniel McGowan, near Big Bear Lake, around 80 miles from Los Angeles. Investigators spread out to search for Dorna in the surrounding area and about 125 police officers went from door to door. All schools in the Bear Valley Unified School District were placed into a state of lockdown. And in 2022, I don't need to explain what a lockdown is for different reasons. February 9th, CNN reported that the Los Angeles Police Department was reopening its investigation into Dorna's dismissal from the LAPD. So as to reassure the public that the police were doing everything in their power to capture Dorna. Hopefully putting an end to this escapade that Dorna is on. Authorities offered a $1 million reward for information leading to the capture of Dorna. For the first time, Dorna's actions were described as a form of quote, domestic terrorism. With Dorna believed to be hiding somewhere in the San Bernardino Mountains, an unmanned aerial vehicle was deployed to aid in the search from the air amid fears that Dorna would be heading for the Mexican border. Later in the day, a Lowe's home improvement store in Northridge, Los Angeles was evacuated based on reports of possible sightings of Dorna. February 11th, the Riverside District Attorney filed formal charges against Dorna for the murder of a police officer and the attempted murder of three other officers. February 12th, police raided a hotel in Mexico based on a tip that Dorna was there. Authorities also discovered surveillance footage of Dorna purchasing scuba diving gear at a sporting goods store in Torrance, California. A message posted on February the 12th to the Twitter account of the San Bernardino County's District Attorney's Office said, quote, The Sheriff has asked all members of the press to stop tweeting immediately. It is hindering officer safety. Hashtag Dorna. That message was removed within a few hours. On February 12th, San Bernardino's County Sheriff's Department deputies responded to a report of a carjacking of a white Dodge truck at 12.22 p.m. and began looking for the vehicle on the ground and from the air. The truck's driver had not been harmed. Fish and game officers were the first to spot the vehicle and recognised Dorna as the driver. Officers from numerous agency chased Dorna to a cabin near Big Bear Lake in California. 
Dorna opened fire on two officers from the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department, hitting both. The officers were airlifted to Loma Linda University Medical Center, where Detective Jemiah McKay was pronounced dead. The San Bernardino Sheriff's Department confirmed to the media that Donna was barricaded in a cabin near the command centre set up for the manhunt and that the building was surrounded by law enforcement. The Los Angeles Times reported that there might be hostages in the cabin with Dorna. A three mile perimeter was set up around the cabin and residents were told to remain inside with their doors locked. Police initially attempted to force Dorna out of the cabin by using tear gas and demanding over loudspeakers that he surrender. It's not going to happen. When Dorna did not respond, police used a demolition vehicle to knock down most of the walls of the building. They then shot pyrotechnic tear gas canisters into the cabin, which resulted in the cabin catching fire. These devices are nicknamed burners as the heat generated by the pyrotechnic reaction often causes fires. Shortly after the fire has started, a single gunshot was heard from the cabin. As the fire continued, ammunition was exploding from within the cabin, making it dangerous for officials to try and put out the fire. Law enforcement experts differ on whether it was justified to use the pyrotechnic devices to end the standoff instead of waiting for Dorna to come out. I'm not sure he would have done. He was like in a cabin He's got food, he's got a toilet. Why would he come out? In the evening of February the 12th, LAPD and the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office denied reports that a body believed that to be a Dorna had been recovered from the burned cabin. In a press conference, LAPD Commander Andrew Smith stated that nobody had been removed from the site, adding that reports of a body being identified were untrue, as the cabin area was, quote, too hot to make entry, end quote. So I'm going to talk about the aftermath now. This is where it gets even worse. On February the 13th, it was reported that human remains had been found in the search of Dorna's body in the cabin. A wallet with a California's driver's license with the name Christopher Dorna was also found in the rubble of the cabin. On February the 14th, Medical examiners confirmed during an autopsy using dental records that the charred body found in the burned out cabin was in fact that of Christopher Dorna. That same day, San Bernardino County Sheriff John McMahon disputed rumours that deputies had intentionally burned down the cabin. It was also revealed that deputies had knocked on the cab door of the cabin earlier 
during the search for Donna, but moved on when they got no reply. On February the 15th, the Sheriff's Office announced that the autopsy showed Dorna died from a single gunshot wound to the head, with evidence indicating that it was self-inflicted. At the same news conference, Sheriff John McMahon reiterated the claim that deputy, deputies had not deliberately set the cabin on fire. The Sheriff's Department, Captain Greg Herbert, who led the assault on the cabin, claimed that the canisters were a last resort, saying, quote, this was our only option, end quote, and adding that the potential for fire was considered. Now, pretty horrific. We have a guy who, from a teenager, wanted to become a police officer and then just went out of his way to make everyone's life misery. He's complaining about who, well, he complained about his classmates while training to be a police officer. He's complaining. Then he works with Evans and complains about Evans and just expects to be believed when he is not and he is fired for lying. Um, all this happens. Now, I'm going to discuss a couple of incidences that happened while this was going on. And I understand the manic um, rush to find Dorna from all of the police involved. And I'm assuming that along the way you have miscommunication because you're dealing with several, they're not all on one radio station. You have San Bernardino, you have the LAPD, you've got several task forces, the Riverside, you've got, so there's going to be miscommunications and there's going to be a lot of manic and trying to find him and you're losing police officers and of course not forgetting Monica and Keith either. We have all this mania going on and I understand miscommunications are going to happen but this is really quite shocking and really quite eye-opening by the police. Firstly, in the early morning hours of February the 7th, 2013, police fired on people who turned out to be unrelated to Dorna. Dorna was not present at any of these incidents. At about 5.30 a.m., at least seven LAPD officers on a protection detail of an unnamed LAPD official's residence in the block of Red Beam Street in the Los Angeles County of Torrance. They opened fire on the back of a light blue Toyota Tacoma and shot its two occupants. Emma Hernandez 71 and her daughter Margie 47 delivering newspapers for the Los Angeles Times. The vehicle according to officers was spotted exiting a freeway and heading in the area of the residence that the officers were protecting. This was thought by police to match the description of Dorna's 2005 grey Nissan Titan and was moving without its headlights on. Emma was shot in the back 
and her daughter received wounds to her hand. Their attorney claimed police, quote, had no idea who was in that vehicle, end quote, when they opened fire and that nothing about his clients or their vehicle matched the descriptions given by the suspect or his truck. The two women stated that they were given no warning prior to being fired upon. A neighbour said the truck was used every day to deliver newspapers and the women who used it kept their headlights off as to not wake up the neighbourhood. The two women were injured but both did survive. The LAPD started an internal investigation into the shooting committed by multiple officers. According to their attorney, Glenn Jonas, 102 bullet holes were found in their truck. The LAPD declined to confirm the total number of officers involved or how many bullets were fired or if any verbal warnings were given to the women before the shooting began. Approximately 25 minutes after this, officers from the Torrance Police Department struck and opened fire on another vehicle. Like the first, the incident involved a vehicle that the police claim resembled the description of Dorna's truck, but it was later discovered to be a black Honda Ridgeline, driven by a white male. The victim of the third shooting by police was David Perdue, who was on his way to the beach for some early morning surfing before going to work. A Torrance Police Department police cruiser slammed into David's pickup and Torrance police officers opened fire. David was not hit by any of the bullets but reportedly suffered injuries as a result of the car impact. Police claim that David's pickup truck, quote, matched the description of the one belonging to Dorna. However, the Los Angeles Times reported that the vehicle involved was once again a different make and a different colour to the one of the suspects and that David, quote, looks nothing like the suspect. In April 2013, the LAPD paid a 4.2 million settlement to Emma and her daughter Margie, the two women who were mistakenly shot by police on the morning of February the 7th, 2013. The city of Torrance offered a $500,000 settlement to David Perdue for ramming his pickup truck and then shooting at him on the morning of February the 7th, 2013. David, to his credit, went, no thank you, I'm taking you to court. The case was set to go to trial in August 2014 when they reached an agreement in July 2014 for a 1.8 million settlement paid by 
the city of Torrance to David Perdue. On February the 4th, 2014, LAPD Chief Charlie Beck announced that eight officers had violated the LAPD's use of force policy and would be disciplined. And this is relating to the three incidents earlier. Beck noted that California state law prevents him from disclosing the nature of the disciplinary publicly, but that discipline would range from, quote, extensive retraining up to termination, end quote. Disciplinary actions for the officers involved did not include criminal charges. So we won't know who got fired, who got retrained. It was all very, very private, all very, very hush, and probably nothing came from that. On February the 10th, 2013, there was, if you remember, a $1 million reward for information leading to the capture of Dorna. And because the terms of this offer were not carefully not carefully stipulated, the judges had to later decide how that reward would be divided. Ultimately, the reward was divided four ways, with $800,000 going to James and Karen Reynolds. This poor couple were tied up by Dorna in their Big Bear cabin before he stole their vehicle. $150,000 went to Daniel McGowan and $50,000 went to McDaniel who helped police earlier on saying I saw him head into Corona and so on. There were online protests against the LAPD as well as a protest at police headquarters on February the 16th, 2013. Protesters stated that they objected to the manner in which Dorna's dismissal was handled. The reckless shooting of civilians by the LAPD during the manhunt and the police intentionally setting fire to the cabin which Dorna was hiding in. What a complete and utter mess this whole case is. Now I'm very thankful, although horrific and should never have happened, I'm very thankful that no one died in those mistaken identity incidences because that would make them equally as bad as Dorna. It, Dorna hit, Dorna got two of his intended victims, Monica and Keith, and then he went on to kill a couple of police officers. I think I counted four, maybe five victims, which is horrific. And all this stemmed from being upset over his job. I mean, what sparks that in someone? Just go away and get another job. You might not like being called a liar um, or you're not happy with the way the case went. I totally understand that. But to then dwell and create a manifesto and take it out on innocent people, it makes no sense to me. I'm truly shocked and speechless. So, there you go. 
the case of Christopher Dorner. He really wanted to be a police officer and yet I don't understand why because he complained about his classmates, he com complained about who he was working with on his first day, he wanted to sue them. I mean, I've taken jobs that I'm not particularly happy in and I left. I don't understand. I remember in one particular job that I had, I was working night shifts in a care home. Years and years and years ago, 20 years ago, I'd finished my night shift, came home, went to bed, and I was due to work the next night, so I slept throughout the day. And then I slept through my night shift. And I slept through half of the next day. Very, very unusual. I woke up and my boobs were really, really sore. So I toddled off to the chemist across the road, took a pregnancy test. Ta-da, positive. So I went to work um, either the following night or whenever I was next on shift. And I confided in the lady that I was working with, I was indeed pregnant. Hence I missed my shift. And then I went, did my shift, that was absolutely fine. Went home, went back to work whenever I was due back to work. And the boss was there, a bit odd, okay. And she said, uh, you're fired because you didn't turn up for work. Okay, didn't like the job anyway, but okay, fine. Um, and I thought about taking it higher because she sacked me because I was pregnant, therefore didn't have to pay maternity pay. I didn't look into it. I thought it for 10 minutes and I moved on. I did not come home, write an 11 page manifesto and persecute her family uh, and all of my work colleagues or anything like that. I just accepted it and moved on with my life and had Carl as a result of that. Absolute madness. Now I have done some more research into, as I was looking up different things about this case, I came across Teresa Evans. If you remember her, she was the partner that was unfortunately put with Dorna and was put on desk duty and all of that. So I want to give you an update on what is going on with her. I'm not sure when this was, but Teresa Evans did file a complaint in the Los Angeles Superior Court. Teresa Evans alleged that she was made a department scapegoat because of the racial connotations of the Dorna case and that she was treated unfairly by members of the LAPD. The complaint alleges that retaliation by the LAPD ruined her chances for promotion and inflicted physical, mental and emotional anguish and suffering. She said she was subjected to racial harassment because of the racial tension sparked by Christopher Dorner and the case that ensued and that she was retaliated against when she complained about the discrimination according to the complaint. Something that's come out is that the LAPD knew about past misconduct by Christopher Dorner while working for the department, according to the legal suit. The officer accidentally shot himself in the hand. He assaulted a classmate during the LAPD training and lied about being in military combat and, very importantly, failed the department's 
psychological exam according to this lawsuit. Absolutely shocking allegations that they have found out. Now, Christopher Dorner's life was one that was characterised by violence, beginning with common bullying and ended with a gun battle and being engulfed in a fire. As a youth, Christopher Dorner went to a school where he found himself to be the only African-American student and he was subjected to ridicule and torment from his classmates. He would end up having several disciplinary infractions throughout school, almost all of them being a result of a fist fight that was caused by tensions between Christopher Dorner and the rest of the students. It's not much of a stretch to imagine that Christopher Dorner's life started out with him being the victim of racism and that this racism tinted his view of the world throughout his whole entire life. So anyone who questions him or stands up to him, it's racism. Then Christopher Dorner then joined the Navy and he was described by the United States Navy as an expert marksman winning medals and ribbons for his skills with both handguns and rifles. So if you take a potentially violent person and give them a gun, what's gonna happen? Now this whole ordeal wasn't without massive public debate, which became quite heated as the nature of his crimes and more importantly, just how right or wrong Christopher Dorner was in his allegations against the police. I have a question for you, okay? Was Christopher Dorner actually right in his accusations? Because as we discussed, the police on the hunt for Christopher Dorner shot and fired at three different people. They didn't stop, they didn't look, they didn't question, they just pound, pound, pound. Oh no, wrong vehicle. So was he right in his accusations that the police still use excessive force without any shred of caution? Are the police purely innocent in all of this? Or was John, was or was Christopher Dorner just another madman, didn't get his way and took it out on the world in the most horrible way? That is the question, isn't it? Sadly, Christopher Dorner died and the general public are left with more questions than answers. And even now, I am just a random girl on YouTube, interested in true crime. I'm sat here talking about Christopher Dorner and the actions he decided to take in that week long escapade that he took. It's hard to say why he done what he done. It just seems to me that Wherever Christopher Dorner went, violence followed, complaints followed, and court cases followed. It's not coincidence. I don't believe he joined the police force to make a difference. I think he joined the police force to boost his ego, to boost his narcissism 
it's my personal interpretation of this case. Of course, I would love to know your points of view. Do you disagree? You're more than welcome to disagree. Just keep it kind. But there you go. As always, please leave your thoughts and comments and reactions down below. I love to hear them. You know I do. If you enjoyed my true crime and you're not subscribed, please consider hitting that subscribe button. Join me on my journey. Yeah. Uh, any suggestions? Again, down below. And I shall see you next week, guys. Stay safe out there.